Welcome to the What Happens Next YouTube channel. What we're aiming to do with this channel is share content designed to make sure that you're supported through whatever's next in your life. And we'd love to continue to do that. I've got a favour to ask today and what I've asked you to do is just subscribe. It costs you nothing, but it really helps us deliver really good quality content on a consistent basis. Thank you and let's go on to the interview. Good morning and welcome to, well that was a bit high, good morning and welcome to uh, this episode of What Happens Next, the show that talks about some of the challenges that we might face when we're trying to navigate that next chapter of our lives. Now, you'll know if you follow the What Happens Next channel that I'm not keen on the phrase retirement and we'll talk a, a, a little bit about that today. Um, but what I want to do is have conversations with interesting people who can provide insight into that next chapter of your life just by really being curious and asking loads of questions. And I'm absolutely excited. I don't I don't want to I don't want to overegg the pudding today, Ruth, but <laughs> I'm absolutely excited that Ruth has chosen to join me today to have that conversation. Ruth, how are you? Hello, Chris. I'm really good. Thank you very much. It's uh, I, I haven't seen you um, for in real life. I think since that um, concert, that, that Rock event. Ukraine was it the Rock Ukraine event we went to. Which was, and you know what? Huge. That was. I, I mean, I, 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 I was out over the weekend with cats actually, and my dancing hasn't improved in the <laughs> like sort of twenty five years that I that I've liked to like. You know, I've, I've, I've loved to dance. But I still enjoy it. I love I it. It's one of my favourite things. Love it. Yeah. What do you? What do you? What's your taste in music? What do you love? Well, it's pretty eclectic, to be quite honest. So, talking of dancing, I um, on Good Friday afternoon, a bunch of friends said they were going to go to uh, Fat Tony's Fat Fest, oh. which is basically I don't know. I didn't really know Fat Tony, but he was a big DJ in the eighties who you know clubbed with Boy George and one thing and another. Practically died from drugs and alcohol, got himself clean 10 or so years ago. And so now he does the circuit doing afternoon dance clubs, right? So this was from 12 midday till 8 p.m. And you just kind of rock up, you can have some drinks and stuff. And he's just playing great, not all cheesy, but mostly cheesy kind of 80s, 90s dance music. Bloody brilliant. It was such yeah. a lot of fun. I've, I've got so the place we went. We will talk about what happens next in a minute. <laughs> but as we're, as we're on music, the place we went on Saturday, my mate Andy, uh, Andy Fano, um, is an amazing guy. So he he does his day job is he's a fundraiser for the hospice. We raise a lot of money for, um, but he um, is a soul DJ. So it's all seventies <sighs> and eighties soul, oh, and it's so many brilliant tunes and like, yeah. literally the dance floor is full all night um but yeah abs absolutely love it we could talk about music all day but let's talk about why we're here um for the i know who you are and i know why this is going to be such a great conversation but for the benefit of our audience tell us a bit about you thanks chris well um i guess um kind of how we met is because we're both um, at our core financial planners, aren't we, Chris? And, yep. um, and th th this is the kind of shortened um, version of my of my journey, but this is probably the more relevant bit that um, I was, uh, and still am actually, a chartered financial planner. And in 2007, along with two great colleagues of mine, we set up a financial planning business called The Red House. Um, and I kind of describe it as my kind of beautiful little boutique business. Uh, we were at our biggest probably seven or eight people. I shouldn't remember that, but I don't quite. And we just had a lovely time advising uh, and working with our clients to really hopefully help them have good outcomes at this kind of point that we're talking about, Chris. This, yeah. this thing yeah. that some people would call retirement, and we both hate that word. And um, and so uh, by doing that, it means you kind of become very technically qualified, you used to kind of running a business, which was lots of fun, built a team, and I loved all of that. And then in 2017, uh, my business partner had had to retire early due to ill health. 
and me and my other business partner, Linda, took the business forward. And in 2017, we were both probably early 50s at that point. And we decided that we wanted to, we'd taken the business as far as we could, and we wanted to find a good business to merge our, our practice into, uh, which we did at the end of 2017. Went through a three-year handover, and uh, which ended in December 20, kind of COVID back end ish yeah. And um, I've spent the last three years been a non-executive director with the firm I merged my business into, who, who are called Paradigm Norton, a great financial planning firm. And I've also been experimenting, I guess, with various other different things because shock horror, me, who spent years talking to clients about accumulating wealth for a future event, find myself at this there. place. There, Chris, there, yeah. and think, Bloody hell, we as financial planners mostly miss out on the really important conversations that we should be having with our clients to prepare them better okay. for this stage of life. So I'm kind of going through this, um, obviously this is a weird expression, lived experience of tiptoeing into this stage of life, shall we call it, and I'm just trying to work my way through it really. So I, I guess that's a little bit about me chris when i'm when i'm yeah. also not dancing well i mean dancing's part of the experiment i'd imagine part right? of the so, experiment you know, we've got, we've got it's been a lifelong a one yeah. but it's interesting would it so so here, here here's here here's here, here's the interesting thing about that so I, I want to explore a couple of elements on that but i suppose the first element would be knowing what you know now about how this transition is often quite challenging in, mm. in, in ways of beyond the money, what would you do differently as a financial planner? So after I stepped away from my kind of day job, so 2020, maybe even 2021, I can't quite remember the time in there, I was approached by an organization uh, called the Institute for Financial Wellbeing, who I know you know, Chris, and I think Chris Budd, who yeah. was the founder, has been one of your guests. And um, at first I thought, financial wellbeing? What's wellbeing got to do with what we do? Um, but I listened and I read around the subject and all of a sudden I had this great big kind of penny drop moment when I realized that actually what we do is in in terms of helping people with money is really really important but what's the context and and what context are we enabling our clients to see money within so yeah. you know and again whether you've done this chris but typically when i used to meet a new client i would uh, obviously welcome them in go through the chit chat and then i would say what's important to you about money and immediately you start to have a money conversation, don't you, with a client? And there were some stock answers that always come up, which we can touch on if necessary. But the question I should have been asking is, what's important to you about life? Because life is this thing that we're all getting through. Um, and when you think about money in the context of well-being, you start to have much more expansive conversations now, the yeah, framework yeah. that actually Chris Budd introduced me to um, was, was one that came through for some research by Raff and Harper, which identifies five pillars of well-being. And in fact, I think you talk about this, Chris, on, on your What Happens Next website. But, but just for the purpose of this conversation, all of us with, within um, need a balance between career slash purpose um, social yeah. relationships, whether that's family or friends, feeling and being part of a community, um, having physical well-being and financial well-being. So yeah. if we as financial planners who have incredible access to our clients because they tend to come and see us at least once a year and they share with us all sorts of things about what's going on with their lives. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I, I did have wide conversations with clients, but it was more... I think we could be much more intentional about asking our clients to think about those five pillars, those five pockets of life and ask them how they're feeling about each of them. Because, you know, I've, I've seen plenty of people who've got tons of money, 
but rubbish relationships. They, you know, their marriages fall into pieces. Their health yeah. is rubbish. Yeah. Um, and they don't know what to do once they stop working that thing that has created the wealth. So, so it's really interesting, Ruth, because I think my penny drop moment was in a meeting where we had a conversation with a client who we knew based on all the plans that we'd put in place was never going to run out again. You know, like ooh. based on the assumptions we used. Done. And, and job job done. So I'm going, great. Here's, yeah. here's, here's how here's how I'm gonna let Mike know that he can be uh he can be like completely satisfied. Um and his uh, his immediate and ongoing reaction was you've sort of ticked one box, but mm. I haven't got answers for the rest. Mm. Um because yeah. how do you and, and again this is something that I, I, I'm really interested in getting your perspective on. How do you work out what your purpose is if you've spent 30 years doing one thing? And yeah. I, I agree with you. It's it's one of those things where if we've got a relationship and trust with our clients, which we're lucky enough to have at Savello, yeah. and I'm sure you had you had with your clients, how do we how do we like unpick that and explore that a bit more? What's the starting point? I mean, I love that question. What's important to you about your life? How do you how do you think a bit deeper, do you think, and explore that in a bit more? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's a really interesting one, Chris. And the the job that we do as financial planners is is very, very wide. Um some people within our profession will argue that our job is to do the technical side of things and to be expert on pensions, rules and tax and investment. Um, and so we are saving clients money by saving tax, keeping charges low, and we're making them money by having a great investment strategy. Many of us have been trained almost exclusively that that's the things to focus on. And part of that is the uh, our examination board and our regulator, I think, have been really focused on yeah. those things. Yeah. I think the more enlightened um, individuals are, re are realizing exactly what we're talking about and that actually we need to develop our skills to become much better at the people kind of skills, the conversation, the asking questions, the uncomfortable moments, asking questions that really make our clients think. Now, interestingly, some people are able to do both the technical and the what historically was called soft skills, the kind of people skills thing. But that's quite a big ask. People who are good technicians sometimes find that they're not so comfortable in the conversation piece or they will stray to the piece of comfort. Now, I think that she's going to sound really conceited now. I was probably quite good at balancing both of those things, albeit when I reflect, I'm glad to have dropped the technical stuff and just do the people stuff these days. But I got away with it, shall we say. No clients yeah. came to any harm. Um and then I used to work or, or alongside other people who were brilliant at that stuff. So that was great. So I think uh, I would love to see more of our colleagues actually getting better around, um, I'm going to call it coaching, call it coaching, mentoring, helping, being a, a thinking partner, call it what you will. The, the title doesn't matter, but it's just having the confidence to ask some of those deeper questions. And let, let's be honest, many of us, and you know, I think particularly for younger planners, we'll get somebody come in who's the same age as your, your parent, maybe, or maybe even your grandparent for some of our younger colleagues. It can feel quite challenging to ask searching questions. But I think it's a skill, it's a life skill. And the more I think we can develop these things, I think the better we're going to deal with our clients. How, having said that, I'm increasingly thinking... I don't know about Chevello, um, Chris, but I know with my practice, we used to have um, an external mortgage broker. We used to have lawyers that we called on to write wills. We'd have accountants to do tax returns. Um, never crossed my mind to actually also have a relationship with maybe a career coach for our clients or somebody who was expert around transitions. A, to somebody who was particularly specialist around divorce. Now, divorces are like a, it's a really challenging time for people to go through. Yeah, again, we can be good on the technical stuff, maybe, 
But are we really equipped to help people who are vulnerable, who are going through stages of grieving, whether that's divorce, death, whatever it might be? So, so either we learn the skills in house or we actually expand our contact base and know and identify. And that becomes our job to go, hmm, I can see that you're struggling a bit. What I have found really helpful in moments like this is to perhaps suggest that you have a conversation with whoever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And very often I think the clients quite like that third party intervention. It can enable them to, I don't know, maybe more be even more of themselves than they are with us. So I don't think there's um, any rights and wrong. I think it's just recognizing it needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, I mean, a couple, couple, couple of things there that are really interesting. So I completely agree. We do something called the Savello Inner Circle, where once a month we get a range of professionals together. Mm. And part of that is to make sure I know who I can trust to, to refer my yeah. clients to. Um, and we have a really sort of uh, sort of wide diversity of people from funny enough career coaches leadership coaches all the way through to some of the more technical aspects mm. like lawyers and accountants i think my my own experience of the transition from being more technical to more human i don't know i don't know what the right word is but let's go for you let's go with human yeah is, is um I think there's safety in the world of technical because the answers are more definitive. Correct. It's right or it's and, wrong, and isn't you it? You go into this world where uh, where we don't know, and actually you're you're moving from a profession that traditionally is mm. here's the client, here's your answer, to mm. well, actually the answer's in your power. We're gonna help and guide and support you to get there, but that's a journey not a definitive yeah. destination um and it's yeah it's it's an interesting one but i i the interesting thing and i've learned a lot from reading your um sub stack which i want to talk about um as because because what's clear from that and i want you to tell me about 1000 weeks mm. but what's clear from that is actually that element of learning as we go is really is really interesting but we haven't got to be definitive immediately right you know we haven't got yeah. to be definitive at all really yeah. so talk to me about what you've learned through that through that transition period mm. what you might do differently if you had a magic wand and you could do it again and tell me about the process of writing about it for a thousand weeks well, there's a lot in there. So um, let me let me just go backwards a little bit first. Yeah. So when and 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 so <clears throat> I've been asking myself the same question, Chris. Like, what could I have done differently uh, in my glide path to uh, this chapter of my life? Now, for me, what when I was running my business. Um, it's busy, isn't it, running a small business? There's a lot going yeah. on. There is a lot. And my head was so full with finding the right home to uh, merge my business into and going through that whole legal and emotional process, both for me and with my team, with my colleagues, with my clients, my head was full to the brim. Um and that continued into the first kind of 12 months of post-merger. And I was unable to really think about anything else. And so yeah. you've got this distant signpost. And for me, it was uh, the three-year uh, handover finished on the 14th of December, 2020. Um, and it was almost like... Uh, that's the marathon line. That, that's the end of the marathon that I need to get to. And then I'm going to collapse in a heat and put a silver blanket around me and, <laughs> and <laughs> try to sort. And then everything's going to be all right, isn't it? And then you get to this point. I got to this point and then just thought, right, now what? Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. really interesting. So could I have done anything differently? I'm not sure that I could have created the space in my head but maybe that's also not true. Maybe if 
somebody had been gently asking me about some of these things, I, I would have started to think about it a little bit more. So that's kind of what happened to me. And then, um, and so I think you were then asking, Chris, a little bit about um, some of the questions that I've been asking in my Substack 1000 weeks. So just to, again, to uh, give a bit of context to what this is. So I read a book about two years ago now um, called 4,000 Weeks by a guy called Oliver Berkman. And if um, and you haven't read it or any, anybody listening to this hasn't, hasn't read it, I, I recommend it. It's a really interesting read. <clears throat> Excuse me. 4,000 Weeks basically equals age 80, give or take. And Oliver Berkman, who started off as like a productivity and time management guru and, and tried all the hacks to try to fit more into his life, I think suddenly realized that actually time is finite. We're all going to die. If we're lucky, we're going to make 4,000 weeks. Some will be longer. Many will be less. What are we stressing about? Like, you're not going to be able to do everything. So be more intentional around the type of things you are doing. I've probably just totally bastardized what he, he wrote about. But in, that that was what I took from it. And as I read it, I thought, gosh, that's fascinating. And then the real wake up call for me was, and when you get to my age, you're only talking about a thousand weeks. <gasps> and and that, by that, I mean, because I've had to explain this to a few people, I've, I've just turned 60. And of that thousand weeks, it's likely that 500 or so, I'm going to be much less able than I am now. And I thank my lucky stars that I find myself fit and well and able at the present moment. So I, I, I kind of been trying to think what to do with my life. And I tried a few different things, I, you know, so I had a dabble with a fitness business with a friend of mine, um, which was a great business called Lady Bones, which was aimed at women <clears throat> approaching and postmenopausal because we as women, our bones tend, we tend to get osteoporosis and stuff and exercise is really good for you. It turns out that I'm not really qualified for that. Not surprisingly, after spending years in finance um, and I've been doing some coaching. But then when I kind of stop and think about it, my I've, I've built up this whole host of expertise, dare I say, around the world of financial planning and talking to clients. I've heard clients for decades talking about some of the challenges they have as they move through life. So I suddenly thought to myself, can I combine the stage of life that I find myself at with what, if I'm going through it, there's probably other people going through this. Can yeah, I start yeah. something that could be helpful for other people that find themselves here? And so I decided to set up um, uh, a, a, a business. Well, is it a business? At the moment, I own the website 1000 Weeks, but you won't find it anywhere because it's not live. Um, and I was going to do a podcast called 1000 Weeks and interview lots of interesting people which I may still do. Um, but at the moment, I've just started writing a weekly blog. And the first one came out on my 60th birthday. And I was going to kind of like do a, I don't know whether it's a countdown or a count up, but I've kind of decided that that could get a little bit confronting. So what I've just decided to do is to take a topic on a weekly basis and just write somewhere in the region of 500 to 1,000 words around the subject that I think is relevant and pertinent. Yeah. And I have either experienced or I've seen other people experience or I've heard friends talk about. And I just want to get calls people to think and reflect or think, oh, that's interesting. That's a good idea. I haven't thought of it that way before. And I've got a whole host of things that I would I would like to bring to to people's attention around that and there will be some money stuff sprinkled in with it you know I'm no, lo I'm no longer giving advice I don't want to give advice but there's lots of money related matters that are incredibly relevant I think as people go through this stage yeah of life. yeah so I mean, 1000 I mean, weeks I mean, is my I mean, weekly blog I mean money which I'm loving by the way and I've got, I've got a few bits that, are, that I want to talk to you about from re reading the blog um, but and I recommend that anybody watching this goes and checks Ruth's blog out, and we'll put links on all the notes. And when we put this on the what happens next website, something you said that was really interesting that sort of finish line, that finish line where you get to you, you get to the end, 
and yeah. like you put the silver silver thing on. I made the mistake when I did the marathon of sitting down directly after. Bad move. Oh. I, I mean, it took me about ten minutes to get. Out. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a gin and top tonic waiting for me in the pub, which was a, oh. which was a good one. However, I I like you are um, tend to be very goal focused. And how do you think? people you know in life um who are goal focused because you get to the end you do the thing mm. and then mm. suddenly you realize that you're not done right yeah. so how, how do you reckon we need to shift our if we do shift our mindsets to become less goal focused and more hopefully well-being focused well i think that's it that is that is the thing isn't it because a goal is has an end in you, you know, the whole purpose of a goal is to reach it and yeah. achieve that thing. And there's nothing um, wrong with it, by the way, is there? It's nothing, just, nothing wrong yeah, with it. Yeah. It's then just what happens next. So, um, you know, you see many people, you know, particularly in a work context, who are really focused on achieving partner, um, becoming a professor, selling the business, which is, you know, mine. Um and that's all consuming. And you think that everything's going to be okay once you've done the thing. So I think probably the, the answer is, is kind of much more within. It's much more intrinsic within us as individuals rather than that extrinsic goal that you can demonstrate to others. And, and I suppose that, you know, as I'm saying that, it's what, what are we demonstrating and to whom unless it's to satisfy ourselves? So, you know, in terms of uh, what happens at this stage of life for somebody who's goal focused, I think it's going to probably take a little bit of soul searching because what have those previous goals been about? Have they been about attaining it? So, for instance, I remember as a financial planner, tended to be men, would say, I just want to get to five million. Oh, that's interesting. Why five million? Where's that figure come from? You know, and I think there was a book that was written by it or somebody down the pub has mentioned it or it sounds quite macho, doesn't it? Five million, everything's going to be okay. I think the question is, was, well, say what? And what's that going to give you? Well, how does that relate to the way you want to live your life or the way you're living your life currently? Um, and, and I think it's probably to try to get to people to think more deeply about what really matters to them, what they're values are in life what their purpose is when are they happy who are they with yeah. what are they doing um i think i think the interesting thing about that that goal particularly a financial one for me is what are you sacrificing in terms of time to get there hmm. and what else could you be doing to, so you're talking about that sort of finite four thousand week settlement and you yeah. say well actually does that matter enough for me to swap that time to do that? Well, yeah, isn't the curious know. thing, Chris? We we as financial planners, typically, we ask a question like, when do you want to retire? Most people never really been asked the question before and have just thought, well, my pension scheme age is age 60 or that's when my parents retired or... Isn't, that, isn't it 60 for everybody or is it 65 these days? I don't know. It's somewhere between 60 and 65 is normally where you land, isn't it? You get the occasional person who thinks they want to be out by 50 or whatever it may be. But most people are like focused on this man-made construct of a retirement age of around about yeah. 60. And they've never thought to question why that might be. Now, I've had this realisation, <laughs> drum roll, because it's so bloody obvious, None of us are ever going to be any younger than we are today. So what are we waiting for? And so very often what we do throughout our working career, like we've got so many other stuff going, stuff going on, haven't we? Younger people are trying to buy a property. Then they're maybe trying to find a life partner. Then they're thinking about kids and they're bringing up the kids. Then they're trying to buy a bigger house. Then they're trying to get on in their career. There's so many things going on, aren't there? And, and that's what society tells us that we need to be doing. But it's, it, with this whole linear 
way of being, is that really relevant? And is that actually enabling us as human beings to live our best lives? I'm not entirely convinced it is. So we spend arguably our best years, if we think particularly of um, physicality, sitting at a bloody desk, having conversations over Zoom, worrying about the, the, the goal that we may have in our career, and actually don't do some of the things that actually we would really allow us to flourish and thrive. And instead we leave it until we're later in life when physically we're less able, financially we may be very much more able, but you really can't be bothered anymore. And, you know, so I think it wouldn't be interesting to try to empower our clients to see their lives in, in shorter chapters where maybe you do work for a period of time and maybe we can enable our clients to see it is okay now to take a three month sabbatical or whatever it might be and go and do some of those things that you always wanted to do yeah and that and and that's the interest i mean i I know you that your perspective on retirement's very similar to to mine it's that you know man-made fixed point in time that we can ignore if we want to and choose to live their lives in whatever way we want yeah um um, and it's interesting where, you know, you know, we've, we've, and the main reason for, for what happens next is I've had so many clients put on that silver, uh, get to the end of the marathon of their career, put yeah. on their silver um, thing and go, brilliant, I've finished. Yeah. Oh God, I'm, 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 I, I could have finished earlier or I yeah. could have done yeah. something fundamentally differently the, mm. that means that we like we we can do that and um, I, I suppose one thing that we haven't explored and i'd be really interested in your own experience and insight in this is identity mm. so so you were managing director of your own financial planning business you've taken on different roles over the last couple of years how much of a challenge was that shift in identity? Is that still going through? And how did you manage that in a way that worked for you? I'm not entirely sure I've landed it yet, Chris, if I'm entirely honest. So yeah. there is that, you know, that classic drinks party thing and somebody will come shimmering up to you and say, and what, what do, do you, you do? do? <laughs> and you know what? For me, I depending on how much I can be bothered, <laughs> I will often still say I'm a chartered financial planner at, because I can't be bothered to actually tell the truth, which is, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm exploring. I'm exploring what I'm going to do next because that takes quite a lot of explanation, doesn't it? And, and I suppose, you know, if it was somebody that I really wanted to talk to, and thought that they would understand that. And that sounds a bit rude. I don't mean it to be, but but I would do. But but it was a lot easier when I was able to say, oh, I own a financial planning business, or I'm a, you know, when I was a practicing chartered financial planner, or or even more recently when I was able to say, I'm chair of the Institute for Financial Wellbeing, because that sounds like it's something. Now what I'm doing, and I'm, you know, just testing it out on you really, Chris, is like, well, yeah, I'm doing a couple of things. So I'm doing some coaching for financial planning business owners and people who are going through periods of transition. Um, I've just started to write a blog and I'm really exploring what life is like at this stage of life. Now, I don't. Is it any of that me, Chris? I, don't, I You know, when you ask who who am I? I mean, and I have thought about this and actually what I thought about is my own prejudice around or my own assumptions around what any of those things might Maybe. mean to the person listening. And I've got a friend of mine who, you know, I love it a bits, and she has had a, a what's what's the right word? It's peripipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipipip
So what's the question yeah. that we could ask instead? You know, how do you spend your time? You know, what keeps you yeah. busy? What are you interested in? What are you, what are you working on? Uh, what do you do for fun? But we don't, do we? And I, and I guess a lot of this is um, kind of wired into us that when we ask a question, so what do you do? Consciously or unconsciously, we're trying to decide where you fit in the in the tribe. Are you part of my tribe? Are you somebody that's going to understand the way that I live my life? What's your yeah, what's your wealth it? bracket? Like, you know, it's like there's so many but things you, that go on. But you look at you look at the range of different so I could meet another financial advisor slash financial planner. And actually, they might do a completely di- they might spend their days completely different <laughs> to, to the way I do, which is basically just have interesting conversations with people I like. Yeah. Um, uh, but but and 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 clearly, there's more to it than that. But actually, like I've, hopefully, I've designed it in a way where I'm I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. But the interesting thing is, how much does that actually tell you about that human? I had an yeah. interesting conversation last night, funny enough, Ruth, with somebody who said, tell me about you, which is, mm, I, I think, a question. far far better question. Mm. And I, I said, well, I'm a dad. But then, I, then when, I'm, when, when we're having this conversation, I think about that, is being a dad of my two girls is really important at the minute. Yeah. But Charlotte's 20 now. So she's yeah. going to be doing a like I'll still be a dad. Yeah. But that role and how that role plays in my life is going to evolve over time, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's what you know that that sense of identity is a really interesting one. But I think one of the things that I'm fascinated about, and you've talked about this in uh, a thousand weeks a bit, is uh, and I'm funny enough, I'm writing about it when I'm sort of writing the what happens next book at the minute is play mm. and you talked about in the blog about how you used to love climbing trees when you were a kid yeah. <laughs> um how and, and and actually i think we as adults we're told that that childlike wonder and joy we feel is just left in the past mm. the more i think about it, the more i'm convinced that actually as part of thinking about what happens next we should revisit play what do you think absolutely I mean yeah what is this thing about like you know I, I think um and I think you might have mentioned this to me you know there's a difference between being childish and being childlike yeah. yeah and when you look at children they're just full of such wonder and exploration and courage um and interest and you know, I, I haven't really thought about it in this context, but, you know, imagine if we, as adults, who've been around the block and think we know it all, were to approach life through those lenses, like, how much more interesting would life be? So I think it's a great thing. And one, one of the things that um, I was with, with my uh, tree climber um, uh, 1,000 weeks that you mentioned... I was trying to get people to remember what it was that they loved when they were kids and was they either were told to grow up or grow out of or they were told they could no longer do it because they needed to get a proper job, et cetera, et cetera. And just try to remember what that that thing was that brought, that brought joy. Now, for me, uh, you know, actually, I'm probably not going to climb trees now because could could end up really nastily. Um, <laughs> but my mom did say to me um, when I was 11 or 12, oh, for God's sake, Ruth, you can't be climbing trees all of your life. And to which I thought, why couldn't I? Um, yeah. And it, but it's become a bit of a metaphor for me. So when I think about the things that I enjoyed as a kid, it was being outside. Um, it was playing sports. I always loved dancing and, you know, like, don't get me wrong. I can't dance to any um, determined pattern. I just love music, moving to music, I guess, is what you would say. Um, and so and I also used to like, and I haven't re-explored this, like I, I remember just drawing cartoons and I'm not a good dry, uh, I'm not a good drawer, but I did enjoy that. Is that something to go back to? I don't know. When I think about like just starting to write my blog, Actually, I quite 
I did quite enjoy that. I can't remember. I, I remember my mom has got some story I wrote in the, you know, in the proverbial attic that I found um, a few, a few years ago. And I read it and I thought, oh, that's quite, that was quite funny, actually. That was quite creative. I think actually I nicked the idea. My dad had a book, a Monty Python book. You're far too young to remember Monty Python, Chris, I'm sure. But, you know, and, and, I, and I, I took a theme from Monty Python and wrote a story about it. But so, you know, I think there's lots of things that we can try and, 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 you know, and just, see how they end up it doesn't matter if they don't work out what, what have you got to yeah, love that yeah love that and it, it's interesting you talk about four thousand weeks that i haven't read but is mm. now on my list mm. um the the one that i'm really getting a lot of insight from at the minute is a book called design your life by bill burnett and his right. ted talk is amazing on this sort of stuff we've talked about on what happens next before yeah and he talks about the concept of applying design thinking to our lives because we yeah. uh we might apply it in business but we, we often don't when we think about our lives and he talks about um low cost experiments yeah. So how much, for example, would it does it take to start a blog? Actually, yeah. it's low cost. Yeah. You can do it. You know, how much would it take to get a a pad and start drawing again or writing stories? Actually, you Absolutely. can play with this stuff now and sort of um, sort of move forward. One thing I'm conscious about, but both because we love uh, we love dancing, but openly admit we're not particularly good at it. What's the song that always Ooh. gets you on the dance floor? Oh, God, there's so many, Chris, honestly. Um, but the one that's immediately come to mind, because I'm catching up with my old schoolmate uh, next week. So it's our school year where we're all turning 60. So you can imagine there's quite a few parties going on. Um, yeah. And we, when I think about dancing with my friends, um, and this is probably youth club-ish just beyond, it would probably be Boogie Wonderland by uh, Earth, Wind & Fire. Absolutely. Or a bit of Brilliant. you know we we are family something like that but yeah i just i just love it it's just brilliant and what song it? did fat tony play that got everybody up um god good question um there were a lot but the one that sticks with me is the um the one that was um they had on sex in the city it's like sometimes i feel like throwing my hand up in the air oh yeah yeah you've got the love you got the love. I mean, like, yeah. oh my God. Amazing. So there was a lot of hands in the air going on with that. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I, I had saw Florence and the Machine do that oh, at a music brilliant. festival. That was fantastic. Really, That really was a good. great cover, actually, because that's a that's a big song to get away with, yeah. Yeah, re you've got to have a voice like Florence yeah. to like really pull that off. Definitely. Uh, tell me a bit. So we've talked quite a lot about what happens next and yeah. sort of what have you learned in this journey so far and where are you in thinking about this sort of stuff so i think i think i've learned actually it's all right not to have the answers and because i don't i still don't i still feel very much like i'm going through an evolution and i think it's really important to 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 know that, to remember that, because sometimes it doesn't feel like that. So that thing when you wake up in the morning, or you look, oh my God, I always, do, like, I always remember clients saying to me, oh, I'm so busy, I don't know ever had time to work. And you kind of like go, oh, really? <laughs> do you know how busy I am? There's a danger you become that person and you find, well, I've, I've done a yoga class, got to pop to the shop later and pick something up and then um, got to put a load on. And right. And so you, you start to expand your day with stuff and you're not really busy, but you're looking for things to fill your day. Now, yeah. the, in some respects, don't get me wrong. And I'm not, not meaning to sound critical. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay just to do everything at a slower pace. And in fact, there is a real joy in that. But with it can also come, for me anyway, a certain sense of discombobulation, like, what am I doing? What am I doing next? Well, I've got loads of things on my to-do list I could do, but I don't fancy doing any of those things. So I, I think, for me, it's important to get a few um, pins in my week that I can then use to 
to kind of pivot me through that you know for through my days um I, I i i i really like that i think i think we're we're really tailored to looking at busyness and yeah. and it's western society is it as a yeah. as a sign of success mm. and i've been guilty of this have, yeah like people say how are you getting on chris i'm really busy yeah like, really busy. that's a win mm. yeah yeah <laughs> um and i i the, like but i'm reading a lot for the book at the minute about um uh the greeks and that sort of that joy and then the joy of purpose you know that yeah. sort of head and it sticks. The what, yeah, yeah what what we're doing to add fun but also what are we doing they they used to call it hedonistic and eudaimonic well-being yeah yeah um and if if the stuff that you're doing is filling one of those gaps great but if yeah. it's filling neither yeah. Then we're busy for busy sake, aren't we? It's such yeah. a, it's such an interesting thing, um, and I think I think looking at the stuff we do is really important. Why? Well, I, I suppose the challenge we've got with that is it's scary because we mm. need the headspace to, to 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 get to that point. Um, as you probably know, Ruth, I love a good book, and yeah. four thousand weeks has been added to my list. Good one. What other book has been insightful for you when you're thinking about what happens next for you um god i you yeah, like like you i've also been reading lots of books um as i say four thousand weeks is well up there there's a there's a there's a book called the pathless path um i can't remember the name of the author that's quite interesting. That's kind of, I would say, more midlife type transitions. Um, um, the book that I've read recently that um, was given to me, which my jury's still out on a little bit, but some really interesting concepts in there, um, is Die With Zero uh, by, I think it's Bill Perkins. Yeah. Have you read that one, Chris? No, um, I've heard that. I've been, it's been recommended yeah. a couple of times. Actually. Yeah, and what's yeah. interesting about that, and I think is something, is is probably the main thing that I've taken from it, and, and I've re referred to it earlier in a way, is there are certain times in life when certain experiences are going to be much more valuable for you than deferring them. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what are we waiting for? And he's kind of premise about dying with zero because of course we don't know when we're going to die and you know that's virtually impossible i think really the point around it is not so much it's living life uh, right it's living life being much more intentional like knowing yeah. what you're doing and why you're doing it and and that also makes me think a lot around you know again this is one for us with conversations with clients and i'm going to write about it as well is that whole thing of when do families when do parents typically give money to their kids and mostly it is when they die. And what's the bloody point of that? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. if we're lucky, most of us are actually getting on in life before we lose our parents. Hopefully we found our own way by that point in life. Yes, maybe it's nice to get some money, but actually is that the appropriate time to get that money? Could it have been more usefully given to a, a a son or a daughter at a, at a younger age when they were trying to get their career going trying to get on the on the on the career path uh, uh, you know but, but you also have to consider that and it, it also potentially can bring that joy of kindness to the Absolutely. person who's giving the money because they're yeah. seeing it aren't they they're seeing so it happen yeah no it's interesting mm. um i will i'll add i'll add die with zero onto the list the yeah, why not, why not? But yeah I'll, I'll take a look at that um We've talked a lot about life, um, mm. but the financial well-being, as you said earlier, also plays a part. Where where do you think it fits in all these conversations? Financial well-being. So, you know, money's important, isn't it? I mean, most people have a on-off relationship with money. Some people are good at handling money. Some people aren't. Well, that's the story that they tell themselves. Um, some yeah. people's are savers, some people's are spenders, yada yada yada. So this money of itself is this massive energy and life force that 
capitalist society tells us is the be all and end all, isn't it? Like it's all around us, like bye, bye, bye. And um, so it is important, but it's only important, I think, if it balances out the other aspects of the, the life, the other four pillars that I mentioned. So for me, financial well-being is a foundation to the other four pillars of career slash purpose, quality of relationships, feeling part of something, part of a community, and being physically well. Money will enable all of those things to a greater, lesser extent, but it isn't about money. If that's the way you're living life, you're going to continue to feel, sorry, maybe not continue, there's a danger you may feel like you've never quite achieved the thing that you want. You never quite feel content. There's always somebody with more. So I think getting money into the right context and financial well-being helps with us and some of the principles that sit within financial well-being that expand into the other pillars is the framework to start to think about a better life rather than just accumulating wealth. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. And it's that element that that having having financial security however looks like like that that looks to you gives you then freedom in the other areas right you know the fact that you can go down and 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 work with your personal trainer without worrying about money and i can go and do a class at the gym, and and it enables yeah. you to make decisions in the in the bits that yeah that foundational element is 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 really interesting i really like that um mm. So talk to me. I I always I, I and as I say, I'm writing the what happens next book at the minute and find it a really oh. interesting process. Where do you get the ideas from when you're writing uh, One Thousand Weeks? Well, this was something that I I kind of learned when I had my financial planning business, The Red House, and I used to do a fortnightly blog, and I didn't want to write about the latest pensions legislation or something. So I'd be like, right, how, what can I do? And I would it would. I used to, the blog used to go out on a Thursday. It would be a Tuesday or something. I think, oh my God, I need to write my blog. What am I going to write about? And almost without exception, that evening going home on the bus or something, I would see something that would spark a thought. So, so for me, Chris, it's so firstly, I can kind of reflect back on client stories, things I've experienced, things I've seen. I've got my own personal experience that I'm currently going through. And I just jot things down on my phone, like, you know, so yeah. notes app on my iPhone, so much stuff in there that I, have you know, it, I think I've got quite a lot of material to keep me going for quite a long time. The latest one that I'm going to write about. So don't like, don't you be doing it, Chris. This is what I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> is So I went to see a friend. Well, I've, I've got kid at hand. I, might, I, promise, <laughs> I, I don't promise I won't steal it. But go on, tell me. <laughs> so I went to see a friend in hospital, actually, this uh, this week. And um, she was recovering from surgery. And she, like me, is also 60 this year. And she was thinking about things she could look forward to when she came, comes out of hospital, obviously. And she she just posed the question to me. She said, "What well, Ruth, what makes a celebration? Now, isn't that a great question? Amazing question. Love it. So so it's like little things like that that I suddenly will go, ah, I'm, I'm going to write about that. So yeah, the your, ideas your, are everywhere. Yeah, your subjects are, uh, uh, are, are amazing. I'm, and as I said, I'm loving the blog. My latest blog was about cheese because I went to a client's house <laughs> and they did they did the and it was it was brilliant. It was mum and dad of an existing client who's in his forties and mum and dad were a bit older, and um, uh, the client said, "Look, can you go and have a chat chat with mum and dad?" And they were up in Milton Keynes, right. and I I I even though technology is brilliant. I, I always like to meet a new client face to face at least once yeah. Yeah. Um, to do it. So I said, look, I'm going to drive up, come and see you, uh, make sure that we're sort of aligned in terms of, sort of working together. They went, great, we'll do lunch. Um, and it was the, they'd gone to their cheesemongers in the local village yeah. and done this. And, 
amazing cheese board, which I've been talking about for about three weeks <laughs> and now writing about. Um, so yeah, my, my one, I, 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 I need to, uh, I, I, but, but this is the interesting thing for me. It's like, we talk about the technical stuff and there's, but you know, we're both chartered financial planners. We're fairly, hopefully pretty good at the technical stuff. Yeah. But if you're not using the money to live the life you want, yeah. For me, including eating quite a lot of nice cheese, what's the point? And celebrating, so, so, you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Spend the bloody yeah, stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Ruth, I've loved this conversation and I look <laughs> forward too. to loads, loads more to come. Where can people find out a bit more about 1000 Weeks? Thank you. Well, um, I'm on LinkedIn, um, just Ruth Sturkey, obviously. I mentioned ruthsturkey.com. Uh, or no, I don't think I did. That's my coaching website. Um, it's a work in progress, that website. But my Substack, which you very kindly mentioned, I think if you just put in 1000weeks.substack.com, that should come up. Yeah. I think if you just put... Well, Google your name and put yeah. 1000 weeks, it comes yeah. up straight away. Yeah, yeah, it should come up. And... Um, I, you know, I'd love to build my um, my reader base, be and and for me, it, the exciting thing about a thousand weeks is, well, in theory, it's a twenty year project, Chris, isn't it? At least if I'm lucky, um, but it it could go off in so many different directions, and I think this is what I'm finding exciting about it. But I'm not putting myself under any pressure for it to be something. I just want it to become. So um, supporting me, Absolutely. reading my blog, is, is, is a, it would be a wonderful start. Well, look, it's been insightful for, insightful for me already, and I'm sure, I'm sure many you. others. So thank you for sharing, and Thanks. have a lovely day. And thank yeah. you for watching. Hopefully you've found it really useful too. Have a lovely day. It's been, it's been fun. Good to bounce ideas. Thanks, Chris. Bye for now.